Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari and this is Great Big History Podcast and this is China. China represents the third way, or at least thinks it represents the third way, a non-Western industrialization. Obviously, it's not going to be American capitalist, but neither is it going to be Soviet as well. So we're going to have non Western industrialization. The communists will win in 1949. The nationalists, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists, will flee to Taiwan with the U.S. help, creating Taiwan as an independent country. Or functionally independent, though both Taiwan and mainland China, both Taiwan and Beijing, still say Taiwan is part of uh, is a inseparable part of China. This is what's called the one China policy. There are two Chinas. One is the Republic of China. That's Taiwan. And there is the People's Republic of China, which is mainland China. So we are, we're back into a warring states period that are both sides claim they are China. They are the real China, but there are two Chinas. So we are living in literally a warring states period. The corruption and incompetence we talked about of the nationalist equaled its defeat. Despite all of its alliances with the West, despite all of its advantages, people just didn't like Chiang Kai-shek or the warlords. And so China becomes friends with the Soviet Union. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Chiang Kai-shek had an ally in the United States. So the Soviet Union is our friends, which in America caused a crisis, which gave us Nixon and McCarthy. The idea that commies were in the government. Who lost China? How could China, the most populous country on earth, the largest country in Asia, go communist? Who did that? Someone must have done it. Well, the answer is it was Chiang Kai-shek. It wasn't anyone in the US government. It wasn't commies in the U.S. Army. It wasn't fictionist, fictional commies in, in Hollywood. It wasn't the Red Scare. It was Chiang Kai-shek. The guy who wanted to be emperor completely failed. So, the Viet Vietnam War, the Korean War showed that China might have numbers, but it didn't have wealth and it didn't have technology. Losing 200,000 troops in the, in the Korean War to save North Korea, to keep North Korea from being absorbed by the United States showed that China had to catch up. It was too far behind. Again, we're back to, we're back to the Qing. We're back to 1800. China is behind the West and needs to catch up. And so Mao wants to transform China from an agrarian, poor country of low productivity into an industrialized country, a modern country. And that is the great leap forward. Now, the fact, the program lasts about two years, tells you how disastrous it is. So what is the great leap forward? One is we don't need the West. We will be independent and we'll kick out Soviet experts. Now, Mao was a great admirer of Stalin and Stalinism. Um, Khrushchev in 1953 had what was called a secret speech in which he talked about, look at all the people Stalin murdered. This is horrible. We can't do this. And basically throws Stalin under the bus. And the idea was we will compete with the United States, but we're going to compete more openly, more transparently. We will show them that, that communism is better. We don't have to murder all of our, all of our enemies. That ticked off Mao. Mao likes Stalin. He likes Stalinism. He's forming a cult of personality around him and his little red book. And so they kick out the Soviet 
experts who wanted to turn China into a new Soviet Union. Well, you can imagine that the Chinese don't, Mao doesn't want to do that. The Chinese don't want to do that. They want to be, China has for the last 500 years tried to be separate from the West. They're not going to now, having won, become Western, become, becomes, they're not, having kicked out the British and the Americans not, and the Japanese, they're not going to become suddenly Soviet. That's crazy. And so they're going to find this this new way. And so what happens? We're going to have collectivization farms. That's very Stalinist, very what happens in Ukraine. And it fails, just like in the Ukraine. But people didn't know how much it failed because that stuff was kept secret. And that equaled mass starvation in China. My parents grew up, and I, to a lesser extent, grew up in a, you have to eat all your food there's starving children in China. Now, there's a little bit when I was young of that, but really I was, you have to eat all your food because there's starving kids in Africa. But for my parents, they can remember it being starving children in China. The Great Leap Forward is a complete and utter mass tra trauma for China. The corrupt bureaucracy ensured that it would happen because they were told to give numbers. The local bureaucrats were told to give numbers and they were punished if they missed the numbers. What that meant was it just faked their numbers. They just made it up. This was also a forced industrialization without any training. This is We're going to see this happen again in North Korea and it's a complete and utter disaster. This forced industrialization without any training. There's no, China was not ready for industrialization. They're not ready for factories. They're not ready for the change. There's not the infrastructure for it. There's not the bureaucracy for it. There's not the education for it. And it's a complete failure. At every level, it's a complete failure. The Great Leap Forward is, is famous for the backyard uh, st steel mill. That you didn't have to have a, a, a giant factory because a giant factory would create a giant company to run that giant factory. And so it was going to be personal. It's going to be private. You're going to have, you're going to have, you're going to smelt your own steel. That's not going to happen because you can't physically do that. Your backyard coal fired furnace is never going to get hot enough to create steel. And so it's, it's just a failure. Everything about it is a farce, except it kills 20 to 60 million people. The Great Leap Forward also incredibly hurt Mao. And so his attempt to stay in charge, you know, who else could lead... You know, now he's getting old and it's who else can lead? Should we replace this old man? The Great Leap Forward is a disaster. It is in every way a disaster. And so there's beginnings of maybe communism, maybe Soviet, the Soviet Union will come back. Maybe we can replace Mao with more forward thinking bureaucrats, technocrats, you know. And so Mao's fight within the party for him to stay in control, and this is in a lot of ways also not just directed by Mao, but it's more directed by his functionaries who want to stay in charge. They know if Mao goes, they're gone. They're probably going to be shot in the back of the head. This is, this is a lot of people who, fought, who were with Stalin. They were worried that if Stalin ever fell, they would be shot too. Many of them were. It just wasn't in 1942. It was in 1953. Um, and so this at the last attempt to, to hold on to power, to solidify Mao as this great leader, as this cult figure, who, remember, had won, had helped defeat the Japanese, though that part is more defeat is in quotes, um, you know, he was perfectly happy to let Chiang Kai-shek army fight to the last man. 
rather than fight the Japanese. He's not a dummy. But he did defeat Chiang Kai-shek. So he is a military leader who won. You know, there is something of bravado there. There is there is something to hang your hat on. But the Great Leap Forward is a disaster. And so what is it going to be? It's going to be a cultural revolution. It's going to make China for Chinese again. Now, you should know that that's a problem. Because Chinese is not one ethnic group. The majority is Han, and we've talked about the Han. But remember, we've got, they've conquered Tibet. There's the Muslim Turks, Uyghurs out in the West. There's the Mongols in the Northwest. There's the Manchus. And then there's lots of smaller ethnic groups that are within the traditional boundaries of core China. So when you say, it, we're going to make China, China again, we're going to make China Chinese again, you got to go, well, uh, what does that mean? And so one is anti-Western culture. The first is we're going to kick out the West. Capitalism and all of the things. This is There's a movie called The Red Violin. We're going to destroy Western instruments, Western books, Western science. We're going to obliterate Western stuff. Now, you can imagine that's already a problem. Right, Because think about all the stuff that since the 1800s has been invented in the West. From music to science to technology to like, so this is like, can you have a car? Or is it just bicycles? Even the bicycle is kind of Western. You know, so... How far does this go? That's one thing. That's one question. The second is, it's anti-urban, wimpy 20-somethings. This is the boomer's revenge. It is a bunch of old people saying, the next generation sucks. These are people who are about to die, looking at the young generation coming up and being like, they're not like us. They can't fight the revolution. They couldn't fight the civil war. They couldn't have suffered the way we suffered. They're getting participation trophies. They're a bunch of wimps. They live in their cities. They go to their colleges. They wear blue jeans. And they have their Oxford button-down shirts. And they kind of dream of the Beatles. And they, 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 they're not us. They're not hard. Well, you can understand that I have a problem with number two because I have dealt with that generation in America my entire life. I'm a Gen Xer. And I have been told how much harder and tougher the world has been from the Depression to my boomer parents to the amount of old people who have told me, hey, life's not fair. Right? When they're when they're stealing money out of my pocket, stealing time, stealing my work and my energy. Hey, life's not fair. Because they can do it. Right? But this is a thing. Now you have to understand every generation hates the generation coming up. This is not new. Boomers hate Xers. And because there's not enough Xers, they really hate millennials. They don't understand Zers yet. So if you're a Generation Z, congratulations. You just get lumped into millennials. Millennials are still 20 to, you know, somewhere between 15 and 25 to boomers. So congratulations. You're, you're, you're young millennials. But this is true in the beginning of the American Revolution. I have the letters of Jefferson and Adams, and in it, it's time and again. It's kids today, kids today. Kids. Go look at the Bible. The first story is Adam and Eve mess up, right? They get kicked out of heaven. Everything is great. They mess up. They get kicked out. What's the second story? The second story is Cain murdering Abel. What does that tell you? That tells you, yeah, us old folks, we messed up, but we didn't murder each other. Kids today are even worse than we were. So the 
even the Bible is telling you old people hate young people. The Amer America is built on that. Every generation is worried the next generation doesn't have the guts, doesn't have the stamina, doesn't have the steel to continue the revolution. Right? Benjamin Franklin, I, I hear this quote all the time, right? Benjamin Franklin comes out of the Constitutional Convention, right? They had already created a government called the Articles of Confederation, and it was a disaster. So they're not going to make a new government, these old guys. The revolution government, the revolutionary people had three governments. They had the revolutionary government, the Articles of Confederation, and then they're going to make a constitution, right? And Benjamin Franklin comes out and they go, what do we have? A monarchy, a republic. Madam, you have a republic if you can keep it. He's an old man. He's about to die. He's telling young people, you're going to fuck this up. If you can keep it. Well, what do you mean if we can keep it? Of course we're going to keep it. No. So old people have always hated young people. The problem is when the government makes that policy, which is the cultural revolution. So what happens when the government looks at all the 20 somethings and says, we have to toughen them up. We have to make them real. We have to show them what life used to be like so they can appreciate it. It's a disaster is what it is. It's terrorism is what it is. So let's get into it. First is destroy all the Western foreign cultural influences. Technology, education, music, literature, Buddhism. Right? I go Western, but you could also go Eastern as well. Buddhism comes from India. Buddhism is not Chinese. Music, musical instruments, dance, art, education, literature. They light it on fire. Right? And now once you set this, what's not acceptable? All right, the car is not acceptable because it's made in Detroit, right? The GM cars are not made, are not acceptable. All right. But what about the bicycle? Bicycles were what? Invented in France? They're at least very French bicycles. So do you get rid of that? Like, and there are people who want to get rid of that. Remember, we're going to have Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge, which basically is make Cambodia a 1000 AD again or 1500 AD again, right? It is turn back the clock to the Middle Ages. So that's what the code and it's inspired. Cambodia is inspired by this. This is going on when the Khmer Rouge are coming into power. So let's get rid of all of this. Technology, education, it's 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 parasitic, it's 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 impure is the idea. We have to make Chinese pure again. Well, you can see the problem with that because culture isn't pure. Culture is always taking on new ideas from all over the place. The second is make students, intellectuals, and young people leave the cities. You'll we'll see the Khmer Rouge do this and for everybody. But it's make them farmers. We're gonna turn college kids into farmers imagine imagine you have lived in, a, in an america where there is a group of people who say oh kids today they get their participation trophies they have to learn how tough life is imagine them being empowered and then saying you have to leave college because it's making you soft and you have to be a farmer can you think of any worse use of your ability than that i mean first of all the farmers are farmers do they need millions of people coming and competing with them as farmers? That's the first problem. And the idea was you're going to learn the values of being real Chinese in a real China instead of this wimpy. And remember, the wimpy is always vaguely homosexual. It's not said out loud because you can't accuse straight people of being homosexual. But it's always a you men are f women. You're you're kind of girly. You're feminist. You're feminine you're there's always this vague homosexuality on a laying on this decadence this you know you see it with conservatives in america today there's always an accusation that oh you're not a real man and there's always this vague sissy wimpy vaguely homosexual it's very homosexual underpinning to that but 
the idea was we're going to turn you into real Chinese in real China instead of wimpy, overeducated losers. Now, we see this in America. This hasn't happened in America because corporations need educated people, right? Capitalism demands education, right? All the people on my Twitter timeline who are like, oh, you don't need a college degree to, to, to uh, make money. Well, Google thinks so. Bank of America thinks so. MetLife thinks so. Geico thinks so. Like, they're not hiring people with no educations. They want people with college educations. Capitalism demands college education at this time point. Sorry, it's happened. Right? Even industrialization, even factories in America require math. High levels of math to use the machines, to fix the machines. Like, someone who says that hasn't been in a factory in a while. They haven't seen what has happened to the American workplace. I don't know. I don't know. But we see this in Sarah Palin in 2008. She went to rural North Carolina to give a speech to a crowd, to a rally. And she calls, she said, I am so glad to be here in real America with real Americans. Well, sh what is she saying? She's saying there is a type of place in America, rural, southern, that is truer to American values and the people who live there are truer to American identity than, than the gay feminized immigrant based people in the cities in New York right well that's happening in the cultural revolution they're saying the same thing and we've seen this. If you take my History 101 course, nomadic peoples always think this about urban peoples. And rural peoples always think it about ur urban peoples. They're rich. They're rich, fat, and lazy. Osama bin Laden thought this about Americans. They're rich, fat, and lazy. Well, of course we were. He lived in a cave for 20 years. Compared to him, we are rich, fat, and lazy. Well, actually, he was rich personally, but the people around him were poor. But... Of course, as a society, we're rich. He lived in a, in a cave in Afghanistan. So, you can see, this is feeding on. And you go, we may go, why are we talking about this for so long? But it's important because it's feeding on long cultural assumptions in many cultures. In China, too, but in many cultures. And it's being turned into violence, into a violent government policy. Because what if you didn't want to be a farmer? Well, now the government's going to make you be one. And what if you're a crappy farmer? That's not good for you or your family. It's not going to end well. What if you liked chess? What if you liked playing the violin? What if you wanted to make a rock band like the Beatles? That's bad for you. You are not Chinese. You are a traitor to the culture of China. And so what is the result of these two things? A complete disaster. Again, here's the example. Eat all your food on your plate. There's starving children in China. That's my parents' life. There's the one China policy, one child policy in the 1980s. The idea that the economy was so imploded that they needed to restrict families to one child so that the economic gains wouldn't be eaten by a larger population. See, so remember, children, children are good and a rising population is good, but not for the first 18 years. For the first 18 years, children just eat. They eat, they poop, and they don't do anything. They don't make anything. They're an economic negative for the first 18 to 25 years. Right? So if you're trying, if you're a society trying to get out of poverty, a high birth rate actually eats into your economic productivity. It actually makes you poorer. 
Because even if you're making more money, more children eat that. So you're, you're, you gain less. So here was going to be the one child policy. They're going to change. They're going to get, come into the family and force you to only have one child. No, that's a problem. And that problem is people are going to want boys because boys in China, as we've talked about, take care of their elders. Daughters marry into the other family and become part of the other family. Notice in America, a daughter takes on the name of her husband, or I mean, used to anyway. She becomes her husband's property. She becomes part of her husband's family. She moves away. So if you have a daughter and you're, you only have one child and you have a daughter, that's a problem because you do not know if that daughter is going to be able to take care of you when you're old. And so that's going to lead to abandoned children. That's going to lead to infanticide. That's going to lead... Right now, China has a massive imbalance of sexualities. Usually, most healthy populations have a slight numerical advantage for girls, like a 51, 52, 48. That's just the way biology works. Biology needs more girls than it needs boys, Right? So in any healthy population, you'll have a slight numerical advantage of women versus men. In China, it is drastically men. By, I don't know, 100, 200 million, 100 million girls, 200 million girls. I've seen different numbers and I don't know. But it's uh, it's it's unhealthy. There's uh, I've read articles that are like, China will become the world's largest sex slavery country. Because there's going to be so many men who need wives that they're going to suck in women from Southeast Asia, from the Philippines, in order to, to, to satisfy that need. And those will be basically sex slaves. Um, I don't know if that's happened. Those are, you know, I don't know. So, but it's a problem. It's a, without a doubt a problem. Um, but it was one of those things that they said, well, we'll deal with it when, it, when, we, when we can deal with it. Right now we need to get richer. Maybe 60 million people died. There are actually no official records in the archives. Um, I've read one article that has, there were no, there are no photographs of the Great Leap Forward in the Chinese archives. You, you do not, if they exist, they don't have access to them. Now that's crazy because the Great Leap Forward is going to be the great success of Maoism. So it's going to be well documented. Every town council is going to have a photographer, an official historian who's going to take notes where did all that data, data go? Where did all those photographs go? Where? And so you get a fake history. If all of that original data exists, nobody has access to it. So all you get is the party telling you what happened. And so even that 60 million dead is an, is an estimate. We don't know. The Chinese Communist Party created a fake history. We have the ruination of a generation of government, of science, of education. Government function effectively in the 70s collapses in China into the 80s. The economics effectively collapsed because it goes back to the 19th century. Remember, that was part of the goal was to turn your university students into farmers, into low productivity farmers. And so basically... Your economics became the 19th century again, when China was poor. You have the destruction of Chinese art, architecture, literature. It's ripped up by its roots because all of that art, architecture, and literature from 1900 or so, from 1850, is Western influenced. So it's ripped up by the roots. Chinese universities by 1980, are useless or worthless. It's a two... Now, and they're still... They're just now recovering 40 years later. And this... Ma why does this matter? And I've had students who have been like, oh, well, well the, the engineering department of this one place is highly ranked in USA world today. Okay. But how's their sociology department? How's their history department? How's art? 
Like a university is all of its departments, not just one department. And let's face it, China's still exporting students. Like I had I had students, these students who objected and they went, no, that's wrong. And I'm like, why are there more if what? And I, I asked them this question, which university do you want to go to? And they said, oh, you Penn, Princeton, uh, Rowan. I went, OK, where are those all located? Or better yet, where in where what's a country they are definitely not located in? And the answer is China. They're not located in China. When you think of what university would you like to go to, you think of a bunch. What are the best universities in the world? You've got the Sorbonne in Paris. You've got the two in England. You've got a couple around the world, right? The French one in Canada. You've got a couple in America, a couple on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, you know, a couple in the South. You can't name a Chinese university. And why does that matter? It matters because it's 2,000 year history of education wiped out. Chinese universities are some of the best universities in the history of the world. Wiped out. Chinese learning was squashed by the CCP in the 70s. And it is such a disaster that you get, after Mao dies in 76, a liberalization. They can't keep doing it. The generation that comes next, and they're not young guys yet. They're still the Mao generation. But they are, they're, we have to change. There has to be a change. And that becomes a liberalization of the economy. Mao is so terrible at his economic, political, at his economic and social policy, that a quiet revolution happens once he's dead. The exact thing he wanted to avoid happens. You get economic growth in the 80s based on a liberalization of the economy towards more capitalism. And it's not quite capitalism, but in a more capitalistic bent. And then 1989 happens, and that will be our next lecture. So the point I wanted to try to get to you is just how traumatic the events from 1950 to 1980 are for Chinese civilization. It is a trauma that all Chinese people of a certain age or over a certain age are dealing with what was supposed to be liberalization, what was supposed to be liberation from the warlords, from the corruption, from Chiang Kai-shek's military rule, from the West, was an implosion. China is worse off in 1975 than it was, I don't know, since maybe since ever. but it is a complete trauma for Chinese civilization. And that matters because Chinese civilization is one, the leading place in East Asia or was. And two, it's 5,000 years old. It has this long history to pull upon, this experience, this knowledge, this education, these, this infrastructure that Mao just pulls up by its roots to start all over again. We'll see what happens in Cambodia when you do that and you don't have 5,000 years of infrastructure to build upon. When you just rip up what is barely seeded. And then we'll talk about what happens after 1989. So be safe. Talk to you soon.